The information in this video is for spiritual practice only. It is intended to help support the viewer's spiritual journey and a more fulfilling and overall healthier experience of life. It is not personal counseling or advice and guarantees no specific outcomes. No individual should use the information in this video for self-diagnosis or treatment or as a replacement for medical, psychological, or practical care. In other words, this is spiritual practice. Always consult with an appropriate professional for specific advice and counsel for your individual situations as needed. Blessed be and enjoy. Mark Angelo Lyons, Drawing the Circle Productions. Which, you know, I would have never, aside from the alliteration, I would have never chosen that as a title that was given to me. So I want to start with a little bit of lecture. Because if I just said, all right, come in and let's sit in silence for two hours for ten bucks, you'd say, I could do that in my car for free. So I'm going to give you a little bit of um, some words. Words do not teach. Even Buddha said I can just point. I just point to the moon. But here are some things that I've learned along the way. So... The core of who we are is divine, which is the paradox of at least the mystical path. And you don't have to be a mystic to understand this. This is where we come into the realm of cliche. All the power is within you. Thanks. All the answers are within. Thanks. At our core is the divine. So everything that we've been looking for outside of us, the answer is within, and that's even in um, traditional Wicca. If that was, if that which thou seekest thou findest not within thee, thou shalt never find it without thee. In other words, all the answers are inside, we do that. So to come up with a symbol of the divine, uh, there are billions of them, I'm going to go with what the Ashaya monks taught me, that they use the infinity symbol because who we are is infinite, and I've yet to be able to do it without the little crossover thing, so I'm not a visual artist. So I'd like you to think that at the core, or at least get the idea that at the core of your being is God, is the divine, is the infinite, not just infinite intelligence, infinite power, infinite love, infinite compassion, all of the things that you want from the outside world is already within you. Then we're gonna draw a circle around it. And this circle is the mind. And the majority of humanity, not just now, but pretty much since the dawn of humanity, has existed up here. What's called the surface level of the mind driving a car, having a conversation, standing at Starbucks, figuring out your order, food shopping. So you get that, that we all pretty much operate the majority of our waking time in there. And of course, in dream time, we get closer. And if it was just this, that would be great because we would have complete knowing that at our core is the divine. But here's what happens. Oh, you learn shit from your family. Do I have to extrapolate on that or you kind of get what I mean? Oh, you're this race. You're this color. You're this religion. This is our politics. This is our story. We get all these stories in there and, you know, some of them are great. Some of them aren't. And by the way, you also learn how to walk. These are grooves, like in a record. Things that are imprinted upon us. Uh, you learn how to talk. You learn you like chocolate. You learn how to drive, but also you have your heart broken. You're rejected. You get an F. You get involved in politics. <laughs> yeah. You get ill. Uh, someone you love dies. So it makes sense that humanity at large, not everybody, but a huge percentage of humanity would rather be up here than deal with all of that. What meditation does is allows you to go from here through that to here. Beyond thought, 
beyond those grooves. And every time you do, so you go down and then you come back out. That's with a different finger, right? And you go down. And now what's happening to those grooves? It's called a pattern interrupt. You're actually rewriting where one would then think enlightenment, aside from the moment where you're in the present moment, which is very enlightening, the process of spiritual development after a while does this. Now that doesn't mean you're going to forget your name, it doesn't mean you're going to forget how to drive, it doesn't mean you're going to forget you like pizza, but it means the, the fear-based, the trauma is gradually over time dissolved and overwritten with something beyond words. Experience is beyond words. You can translate it into words. I don't know why they're giving me this, but when I was a kid, not little, little, but, you know, a tween, for a couple of Christmases, my mom made manicot from scratch. Oh, sorry for you non-Italian. Manicotti. It just sits in my mouth like a piece of lead when I say it that way. Manicot. And she made the pancakes from scratch, right? I cannot tell you how delicious those things were. That was an experience, but I can tell you about how she made them and the process that she went through and how I, I helped her fold them and stack them. And like, I was part of that process. That's how I learned. My mom taught me how to cook by you know, showing me how to do it. But there's no way that I can translate to you how delicious homemade manicotti is, particularly because my mom made them, right? Because there's all sorts of cycle, because it was my mom who made it. It wasn't frozen. It was... So what overwrites this stuff is experience that you try and put into words to people, and it's what I call lead balloon revelations, where I felt total peace. <laughs> like to anybody else, I'm like, oh, that's nice. Then what'd you do? It's like, what, isn't that enough? Try to explain to someone who's never had a drop of alcohol what it's like to be shit-faced drunk. It sounds crazy. So as much as I can give some lecture to this, it's the intention of Meditate with Mark is first of all to create a space where we can just come together and meditate. But it's also to share ways in that have worked for me. And I know a bunch of them. And so in this series, it's not really a series, it's, a, it's like a gathering or a meeting. Like which class cycle one, two, and three, they're series, they're, they, they're sequential. This is not so much that, sort of like interior collective. It's not a set curriculum every Tuesday. Um, but we're gonna discuss both East and West uh, as journeying, the shamanic journeying or visualization or path work is, is another word for it. Yes, is a form of meditation as is creative visualization and Silva Mind Control, which sounds like an evil plot. It's not. If you want to go Google Silva, S-I-L-V-A, Silva Mind Control. Um, creative imagery, it's been called all these things, is very Western. You would never go into an ashram or a temple in the East and they would say, okay, now close your eyes and imagine Buddha. They would never do that. As much as they would set the space, a sacred space, a temple, where the stillness and the silence of being would be more accessible than out in the marketplace. That makes sense? That's the intention of Meditate with Mark. And this really has nothing to do with me, except that those are the, oh, it's not up there anymore. Those are the words that they gave me. Now, before we go into our first meditation, I do want to just say something that I have learned these past few weeks. We are in an unprecedented time on planet Earth. We were just discussing this outside. And this is something that I got uh, from Carolyn Mace, one of my favorite teachers on planet Earth, by listening to a talk that she gave about 20 years ago, probably more than that, called Spiritual Madness, about the dark night of the soul. And she said that we are in an unprecedented time because we are trying to merge together the mystical path and the human path at the same time, and it's never been done before. In the past, when you had a mystical calling, when you were being called by God, which is a nice way of putting it, it sounds really nice on paper, you would, what's called, take up your bed and walk. You would 
leave your family, leave your home, journey far away to a temple or an ashram or a monastery, or if you took the hermitage, a mountain or a cave, shave your head, which, by the way, the head shaving thing, I know, I cut my hair, my hair used to be really, oh God, that was hard enough, shave it, no G.I. Jane for me. But you would do that because the hair represents memory and identity, so you would shave that off and you would change your name. Now, that's understandable um, if you were raised Catholic and dealt with nuns, because there are, an awful lot of them were named Mary. They weren't all named born Mary. So you did that to surrender your human identity and take on a spiritual identity. Renaming is not new. That goes back thousands of years. And how many of you have a magical name? How many of you change your driver's license, though? Okay. <laughs> but for the most part, that's a name that we use almost as a technique. Like, I am Lord L. Star Moon Crow, whatever. Um, and that was great in the past, except, like I said, they had no Wi-Fi. <laughs> Oh, it's like you had to scrub floors and peel potatoes, which is, by the way, still what you have to do when you go into an ashram, uh, probably in a monastery to make you work, too. It's not a spa. But how many of you have time to do that? How many of you have time to <clears throat> pull away from the world for a year or more to take the contemplative life and pray all day long? I don't. I do this for a living, and I don't even have time to do it. So the paradox of the time that we're in is, first of all, we are in one of the more chaotic periods of, of history where everything that we have known has been thrown up in the air and is like 4th of July bursting into sparks and falling back to earth. Somehow that is divine order. And at the same time, we have to, this is the real, this is hard, this is the challenge. We have to build a sense of self strong enough to be in the world and succeed and pay bills and have a social life and get along with our families and, and have friends and social media, right? Like all, and the technology on one hand, which you could say is evolving the ego, the false self, because we're not all separate from each other, but we believe we are, while at the same time having all of that dismantled through a mystical spiritual path and mace God bless Carolyn May. She said that this began to happen with two events that happened in our history around the 50s, maybe a little earlier. The Dalai Lama's exile from Tibet and Vatican II. So both Eastern and Western mysticism was set loose upon this world practically at the same time. Where now people are having mystical discussions and they don't even know what mysticism is. People talking about chakras at Starbucks. Right? Right? People talking about shamanic descent in Darknet, well, maybe not around, well, in my circles, people talk about that, but, you know, oh, we create our own reality. And going to yoga as though being physically limber was a path to enlightenment. As though eating organic was some guarantee of enlightenment. Can we file that under horseshit, please? It's not about what you do in the physical world, the outside world. It's about what you do in the interior. So being even raised in that, that whole thing of, okay, the external rituals might have been great for a thousand years or so, but we're being called deeper. Granted, the 50s was a time of great prosperity, but also a time of great hypocrisy. If you look at the world wars that we have been through up to that point, there wasn't a lot of introspection you can even look at the Beat era and the Beatniks and all of that as a beginning of the cracking of consciousness. Which, you know, we think of cappuccinos and berets and bongos and yeah, that's it. <laughs> Great rhythmic shamanic mantra. Um, and certainly the 60s was a time of chaos. Not that we're completely reliving it, but we're at that place again where everything that we thought was solid, that was sure is not only being threatened, it's past the threat point and it's already falling apart. So meditation in this context is not just a personal practice. It is a means through which the new comes through us into the world without saying a word. 